Well, welcome everybody. Wow, was that good or what? I mean, thanks you guys, awesome. And so, uh, yeah, thanks Wilson. Well, so glad that you're with us everybody. Welcome to Easter, happy Easter everybody. Thank you Wilson Smith for doing this for me. This is uh, year 36 for Pam and I doing Easter at South Lake and 23 of those have been with this man right here. And uh, we are, uh, very grateful for him. I want to say that this Easter. I want to say how grateful I am for our band, our team, and all that they do to create the environment for worship. The fact that Aaron Meyer is with us again this year is so amazing. Aaron, thank you. His wife Renee that's here. And uh, we're just, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's awesome. The team, the volunteers, so many of you volunteers working with our staff have created spaces and places around our building here that are safe and we think a good, you know, place to receive uh, and express worship, receive the word. Uh, those of you in the hub, great to have you here and hope you're comfortable out there. We have people in the tent out here. This tent is working well, I think. Awesome to have you here. And then the tailgaters, I think I'm told the first service you can hear me and see me. And so I know they're gonna have a happy time at Easter. Um, it's a BYOB event out there at the tailgate party. So I, I think we might, that might become a weekly deal. I'm not sure. I'm hearing some pretty good reports about from the tailgaters. But, uh, but really, it's awesome to be together. I should probably mention, too, that next week we're going to go back to one service 10 a.m. at this point in time. So just to make note of that, if you will. Well, we all know that this last year, due to COVID-19, has been, what word would you use? Wait, you're in church, remember. How about awful? <laughs> in many ways, I think awful is the word. Now listen, I know it hasn't been all bad. I know that God is doing stuff and God will continue to do stuff. He's using it, he will use it. But I mean, awful is probably a good word that might approximate the word that you're thinking to describe, you know, this last year in the pandemic plus. And by pandemic plus, I mean it was pandemic plus, uh, I mean, how many things have there been? Political, social, economic, total upheaval, right? And so here we are. And yet once again, we come to Easter, which shows up every year, right? Like Christmas. In fact, Christmas and Easter, every year, our team asks me, well, what are you going to be talking about this year? And, and I look at them like, well, the resurrection for Easter. They always seem a little surprised. Oh, yeah, I guess that's right. So, I mean, Christmas is all about what? Joy to the world, God is with us, right? Easter is all about, he is risen, so, so what does that mean? So there's always new life, and there's new hope that's available to us through Christ. Romans chapter 8, which I'm not going to take a lot of time with, is a very foundational uh, chapter in the Bible. And Romans chapter 8 talks about creation, all of creation is groaning, it says, with an expectation of the anticipation of the full freedom and redemption that will happen when Jesus Christ actually returns to planet Earth. And actually, a pandemic is part of that groaning. You know, that's just one of many things that are reflective of the groaning of, the, of all of creation that we've experienced this last year and we continue to experience. And I believe that what God is, one of the things I believe that God is saying, and I think there's a groundswell you can begin to sense in it. It's not just cultural but I think it's deeply spiritual, that there is a certain expectation, there is a certain anticipation, there is a certain, if you will, a groaning that I think we're all feeling for the restrictions of our, you know, the, that have happened through COVID and just living in a fallen world. I, I'm not saying we should stop wearing masks, take off your masks, everybody, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying we should not social distance. But I think that you can sense it in the culture, but I think especially for God's people, there is a sense of a, and it's deeper, it's, and it's personal, that there's something being sort of induced, inspired within every one of us of a desire to be set free. A desire to be set free from some of the limitations that sin or culture or whatever have brought to us in recent days, this last year, whatever it is. I do think it's, it's something God is doing, something God is inspiring, and something God is saying, so that, we would, so that we would come to a place personally that we would move forward, that we would break through, that we would be freed up, 
to really experience what Easter is all about, which is, as I said, new life. And it's new hope. But really, the phrase I want to use uh, this year, and we're going to look just a second at the story of Lazarus, is tomb time. That what tomb do you need to walk out of? What tomb do I need to walk out of in my life? I think that's a question. God wants you to be free. God wants you to be free of certain restrictions that I think sometimes come to us, I think for sure this last year, that have, that have come to us. I'm not talking about mindsets, again, not talking physically, talking about deeply, personally, discouragement, loneliness, isolation, uh, things that we, you know, that we feel that we that just begin to settle in. And God wants you to walk out of that tomb. Those are tombs that God never created you to live in. They're places of darkness that God wants you to be a part of his light. So it's, uh, it's in John 11, 25, 26, I'd like to direct your attention. Story of Lazarus, going to look at it briefly. But Jesus, in the middle of the story, and really preceding the verses we're going to read, he, he makes one of his great, what are called the I am statements of Jesus. There's seven of them in the book of John that are, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the... Uh, door, I am the bread of light, you know, the, but this is one that he makes. And here's what he says, and there's three things I just want to draw your attention to, again, really quickly. But he says in John chapter 11, uh, verses 25, 26, you don't have to wait for the end. I am, right now, resurrection and life. <laughs> the one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this, Jesus said. So Jesus is saying you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for the end to live. You don't have to wait for the end of time. You don't have to wait to the end of your life. You don't have to wait to the end of COVID (laughs) to live, to really live. We call it when and then thinking, and we've all done it. When I get through school, when I graduate, then I'll be happy. When I get married, then I'll be happy. When I get unmarried, then I'll be happy. (laughs) When I have kids, this is a great one, then I'll really be happy. Give me 10 of them. I'll be really happy then. By the way, grandkids, you get grandkids, you get happy. They're awesome. (laughs) It's true. But Jesus is saying, you don't have to wait. You can't wait to be happy, to experience. What is he's talking about? Life. Resurrection life. And there's three things that he says here that are implicit or explicit in the scripture here, just in these two verses, is number one, life is a person. I am, he says, life. It's not philosophy. It's certainly not a religion. Rules, regulations, religiosity, all that stuff. It's its own restriction. That's not the Lord. It's not a, it's not, it's a person. Life is a person. Secondly, life is is a proposition. Have you ever been propositioned? (laughs) Proposition is an invitation. And God has a holy proposition for you. He has an invitation to you that is always available to every single one of us. The doors are wide open to come to him. And then the third one is life is present. What does that mean? It's current. It's not future. It's not past. Not life. Not real life. It's in the moment. You can't live for the moment, but you can only live in the moment. There's no other life available. God makes life available through Christ in moments of faith. It's when I exercise personal trust in the person of Jesus, that's when new life and new hope happen. That's how it begins to happen in my life. So it's not when and then, it's here and now, because he's now. Right now, he said, I am the resurrection life. So he ends with this question, okay, and then we'll move on from this point. Do you believe this? Most important question anybody could ever ask you. It's a life question. It's an ultimate life question for every single one of us. Do you believe this? That Jesus Christ is who he says that he is. And notice, he didn't say, do you believe in the church? I happen to, which is pretty amazing after 100 years pastoring or whatever it's been. But I, I just believe that we're all imperfect and it's a process and we're all in different places, and, but that's, I, that makes sense to me. Of course the church is imperfect. It's made up of imperfect people. 
There's an old saying, if you find the perfect church, don't go there, you'll ruin it. <laughs> and we're not perfect, but far from it. But the second thing is that Jesus, um, there's moments of faith that he says to us that he doesn't say to us, rather, do you believe in the church? Do you believe in the Bible? He doesn't say, do you believe in the Bible? Think about that. Even though, again, I do. Why? It, it, it's, it's a whole series in itself, but it comes down to the fact that I believe that God is big enough to preserve for us an accurate revelation of his word and purpose. I just believe that God can do that. Some people don't believe that God can do that. I, I believe that he, that he can't. But, the quest, but Jesus, it's not about the Bible. It's not about the church. Oh, you've got you've to understand this. You've got to understand that the question that you and I are asked, that's the ultimate question, is do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is? That he really is the resurrection and the life. He is the place for you and for me to find real life. And so we're going to look at four things again quickly. John 11, 39 to 44. I want to look at the text with you. I think it adds some substance to read through it. And the underlying idea is that I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to us, it's time to come out of the tomb. So I have a couple of tombs. I'm just going to confess that I think God's calling me out of. And so what about you? I wonder if it would apply to you. So, but these are the four things that are here in the text that really are instructive, I think, for how we do that. So the first one, and you're going to love it. it, it well, let's read. Let's read the text first. Getting ahead of myself. John eleven thirty nine 39 to 44. Then Jesus again groaning in himself. By the way, Jesus was good friends with Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus who had died. And so Jesus was um, groaning. It was very emotionally intens intensive for him, this, this whole event. Somebody had come to him and said, Lazarus is sick. And Jesus waited. It's a really interesting story. You might want to read it later. And Jesus waits to go to Lazarus, his friend. And they said, and so he finally gets there, and Lazarus has been dead for four days. And they say, well, Lord, if you would have been here, you could have done something. You'd healed him or whatever. And, and Jesus still, Jesus wanted to do a bigger miracle than healing. He wanted to do a resurrection. And, uh, and, and so, but everybody's in grief. They're mourning. They're weeping and they're wailing, of course. Some of that was very deeply cultural and, uh, and very expressive. And Jesus also was moved because of the friendship and because of where people were in their, sort of in their understandable, but still in their unbelief. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb of Lazarus. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, <laughs> for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you, I thank you that you, I thank you that you, and I know, <laughs> thanks guys, that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me, that you really did send me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, loose him, loose him, and let him go. Let him go. So let's look at the four things. You see them all right here in the text. How do you come out of the tomb? How do you come from death to life, really? And the first one is you've got to acknowledge the stench of your dead circumstances. I told you you'd love that. You've got to acknowledge the stench. That's what happens. In verse 39, Lord, by this time, Martha says, there's a stench. Now, many a sister has said her brother stinks. I know mine was here last service, and she acknowledged she was nodding at me when I said that. So. But now we're talking about, I mean, by the way, i got to tell you a story, true story. A friend of mine, pastor friend, uh, Tom Ferguson, who pastored, he's with the Lord now, but years ago he pastored a great church in Everett, Washington. 
and just a very real guy and just always kind of, anyway, fun guy. Really good tennis player too, by the way. But anyway, he, he, uh, he had this kind of large mustache and, uh, and uh, he, but he had this, there's this one day that he was like something, there was a, like a smell, a bad smell. And, you know, he was around the house all day working it from home and there was like a, you know, in the kitchen, he, it was smelly. It was when in his office, it was smelly. He went up. It's like every, everywhere he went in the house, it's, it stunk. You know, and so finally he's complained to his wife. He says, "What's the deal? It smells." And she said, "I don't smell anything." And so he goes to work the next day. Same thing, stink. And it like this went on for three days or more. Finally, he's like getting ready one morning, and he kind of looks in the in the mirror, and he sees in his mustache a piece of cheese that is just stuck. Right there. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I don't know why I love that story. I love that story. If you knew Tom, you'd know. What a great story that is. But he realizes, hey, the stink is me. I'm the stink. I'm the problem. <laughs> well. We're, now we're talking a dead body. We're not talking about cheese and a mustache. I did a little research. It takes 24 to 48 hours for a body that's decomposing to really start to get a smell. In fact, I'm told that if you ever smell a dead body, you will never forget it, ever. And But now it's four days. I mean, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. So when Martha says about her dead brother, he stinketh, I think is how the King James puts it. What is she doing? She is simply facing the full reality of the circumstance. The Lord, uh, how can this even, I mean, what can you do? I mean, it's, it's, it's hopeless. And I've noticed in life that it seems to, and you probably have too, it seems to be a preliminary to seeing God do something special when you're dealing with difficult circumstances or dead circumstances. That it seems to be a prerequisite that we first, before we can move from death to life, that we admit that there is something really wrong in my life. Something is really foul about my life. I gotta admit that. Have you noticed, and this is on your outline, uh, circumstances, dead circumstances have a certain aroma that permeates our surroundings and often we are the last ones to acknowledge it. Am I the only one? I can be the last one. I mean, everybody around me knows it stinks, it, 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 it stinks and you're the problem, dude. But I, I don't get it. I don't see it. And so I wonder about us sometimes about this. I think, I think there are times we hang on to things. Uh, you know, we hang on to a job or we hang on to a relationship. And everybody else knows. It's dead. Basically, it's dead. But we don't, we don't see it. Oh, he's going to change, or she's going to change. I can change them. And, hey. And I, now listen, please. I'm not saying throw cash in your marriage, okay? Heard Pastor Kip's Easter message, I'm getting a divorce, you know? And that's not what I'm saying. You may need a new marriage. But the new marriage you need is a new marriage with the person you've got. And Jesus can do that miracle. Jesus can do that. He absolutely can do that. But I think a lot of times we're hoping that a career path will work out or a childhood dream will work out or some relate, some, a dating relationship will work out when everybody but us seems to know that it's not going to work out. I was reading 16 sentimental things that people hold on to for too long. Have you seen this? 16 says, so I'm just going to run through it real quick. See, see if you can identify, kind of keep track as I go through this, how many of these are you? 16 sentimental things we hold on to for too long. One pictures, two t-shirts. <laughs> I got 20 t-shirts that I'm never going to wear. Ticket stubs, that's a good one. Gifts that people have given us. We don't want to hurt their feelings, right? Letters, how many times do we go back and reread letters? No, we never do that. But we're hanging on to all these letters. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, foreign money. <laughs> That's valuable. Birthday cards. I'm guilty. I, I'm terrible with birthday cards. I keep them all. 
um, certain toys, old clothes, stupid souvenirs like keychains and pens, newspaper clippings. You're in the newspaper one time, right? You buy 10 copies <laughs> and then hang on to them until they're like so yellow, they're falling apart, right? You can tell I've done that. Dried flowers, I, from a day, I guess dances. Ladies, have you done this? I don't know, guys have done this. Probably some have. But dances, dates from the past. Um, magazines, deflated balloons. <laughs> balloons are meant to be deflated. We all know that. <laughs> and then home videos, and then, of course, old cell phones. How many of us have at least five old cell phones laying around? I do, too. So, I want, by the way, I want to just ask, how many of you could identify with at least half of those? 16. At least eight or more. Most hands are up. Go ahead and leave them up. How many uh, can identify with, like, you know, more than that? How many less than that? How many, like, none of those? You don't, anyway. Notice who's hands up. These people are dangerous. They're heartless. Watch every move for the rest of the service. <laughs> We all tend, you know, and it's hard to know. What's the old song? Uh, it's hard to know when to hold them and when to fold them. And, and that's really true in life. But I think we all tend to, I know I do, hold on to some things way beyond the time when they are life-giving. That's the key. They're not life-giving anymore. And so when certain things begin to deteriorate, deteriorate or decompose, it's apparent to the people around. The people closest to you get it. It's done. But do you? Do you? And so what does she do? What Martha does is she's, she acknowledges the reality, but here's what she does. She faces the fact. And that's consistent throughout Scripture. Do you know the father of our faith, Abraham? Romans 4.19. Abraham says the father of our faith. He wanted to see. He believed, God had given him a promise. And... Uh, of a miracle of birth, and he would be a father of nation and nations, actually. Look what it says in Romans 4.19. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact. Look at that phrase. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. But what did he do? He faced that fact. He, he desired to see God move. He desired to see God's promise of life fulfilled in his life and through his life. But he had to come to a point where he acknowledged that there was no way in the world it was going to happen in natural terms. It could only happen through a miracle of God. And I think God wants to do a miracle in your, your life and mine. But the first thing is come to a point, point where you understand that something's wrong. Something's not happening. Something in my life, and it's me, is it, it kind of stinks. Life kind of stinks. <laughs> and that can be a first step. It's a good first step to a whole new day, new life. Look at number two. We'll move more quickly. Remove the barriers to life. You have to remove the barriers to life. Verse 41, Jesus said, remove the stone. And he said it with emotion. Remove the stone. There will always be barriers to new life happening for you and for me. Coming out of death into life, out of darkness into light. There always will be. For anything God wants to do in your life, there's going to be something, some, because it's a war we're in. It's a spiritual battle. There will be risen, uh, you know, there will be in your life things that will arise that will block, attempt to block what God wants to do. I remember when our pastor, Roy Hicks Jr., died. Roy was just an amazing man. And somebody sent an old video of him to me recently, and thank you for that, because it's like, and they sent a little note. It's a couple, there's, we have a few, few people here that, we're there in those days in Eugene when all of us, a bunch of long-haired whatevers, kind of met Jesus and started going to church. Never thought we'd ever go to church. But it was Roy and his, you know, and, and, and he, he was really the beginning of over 50 churches. We're one of them. Mike Meeks is another one. Uh, being planted all over the Northwest. And so, you know, when Roy died about, God, it's been 20 years ago or so now in a plane crash. He, he was flying a plane when he shouldn't have. Uh, he, he had his license. He was weather related, and uh, I remember, I remember when that happened and hearing about it, and I remember thinking, I don't know if I want to keep going. I don't know. I don't. I really don't know if I want to keep doing what I'm doing. And in fact, Mike Meeks and I talked about it. 
we, and there was a bunch of us, because we didn't do this. Like I, it's not like I woke up one day and said, hey, I want to go pastor a church, or I want to plant a church. No, there were a group of us, crazy. I mean, you know Mike Meeks, right? Is he the definition of crazy? I mean, a bunch of us, <laughs> Wilson's laughing, he knows him well. A uh, bunch of us, I mean, we just, you know, we were never, never considered being pastors. We, but God, Jesus had saved us, and we had this vision of what a church could be different from religious, religiosity, churchianity. We, we came together, and we had fun, and we played golf, and we teased each other, and we just, you know, it was great. But now he was gone. Roy would get this together, and he'd teach us, and believed in us. And I thought, I don't know if I, I don't know. Mike had the same feeling. But then it wasn't too many days feeling that. And it was a real obstacle for me, especially at that point of where our church was, where I just thought, you know, I think maybe I'm, I might be done. That it went from, I don't know if I want to, to I think I have to. And Mike had the same, as we talked, Mike had the same response. You know, it's like God did something in our heart, removed that obstacle. It's like, you know what, it became an inspiration. Something was entrusted to us that we have to continue because it's not about us. It's not about what I want. Your life isn't about what you want. It's about your assignment. You are create, created in the image of God uniquely. There's something for you to do. And so the barrier was removed and I was able to do it. You know, there's a man named Viktor Frankl, a Frankl, Jew, Jewish man who we probably should all read his book right now, <laughs> Man's Search for Meaning. If you've never read it, it's probably a once a year read and especially after going through COVID like we have. But um, Viktor Frankl writes about the people who made it through the Nazi concentration camps, the Jews, and uh, it's really profound, it, but he's a doctor and created a whole form, of, uh, a whole arm of psychology out of study of what people went through. People that survived the concentration camps, and of course there weren't that many, but those that did, he said oftentimes came back to a life that they didn't do well after the war. They were liberated, but they came back, and he said it was because of their expectations. They expected a wife to still be there, a husband. They expected kids or grandkids to welcome. They expected life to sort of go back to normal, and it never did. It wasn't the same in their lifetime. It just it didn't happen. He said, but the people that did well dealt with the obstacles. The people that did well in their mind and in their heart, they dealt with the obstacle of expectation expectation can be a huge obstacle, or for us, oftentimes, a right. We don't even know it, but we've taken, it's like our right to have life be a certain way. And he said, but they would deal with that, and so, and they, they took their expectation, they took their, really their inspiration for life to a higher level, instead of going back to a wife, it's like there's a wife looking down on me. Instead of going back to kids, there are kids who've died, but they're looking down on me, they're in heaven. Instead of um, grandchildren or instead of, you know, it's, it's like something that can't be taken away. They made their purpose in life. I must go on. I must live because of this that can never be taken away. And it inspired me because those people did well. Those people in many cases went on to change the world, created a whole new world after post-Nazism. It's a powerful thing. Look at what Jesus said in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 12 that we must focus, uh, or uh, the Bible says Hebrews 12, we must focus on Jesus. He saw the joy ahead of him, so he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace that it brought him. In other words, rather than saying, I have a right to be God, I shouldn't have to come down and die. I mean, it's enough to live in human form as deity, but now to die a death? On a cross? You know, why? You know, I, I have a right not to do that. No, he said he had a higher, he saw the higher purpose. And incredible that he loved us so much that he would be willing. It says that for the joy set before him, he endured all that. That's incredible. But that's removing all the obstacles, the ultimate obstacles, even of identity. Saying, I'm laying that down to bring salvation and redemption for you. Verse 40, Jesus said, if you believe, you will see. A lot of people think if seeing is believing, Jesus says believing is seeing. Once you start believing, you will see. 
1 John 5, 4 says, for our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. Faith is the victory. It's only faith that overcomes a world of death and darkness. So the question here is, what is it for you and me? What is your darkness? What is your tomb? What is the dead part of your life? What's dead? Maybe it's due to failure. Maybe it's due to discouragement. Maybe it's due to fear, or hopelessness, or loneliness, or whatever. But will you acknowledge it, and then will you allow God to remove whatever obstacle is there to your faith? Because it's all about trust and be willing to trust in him. Remove the barrier to life. Look at number three. The third one is to choose to leave your tomb behind. Verses 43 and 44. Verses 43 and 44, it says that he... He who had died came out, excuse me, number, uh, jumping ahead here. Um, it says, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, Jesus did. And he who had died came out. And so it's obvious, but Lazarus had to choose to come out of the tomb, okay? We have to choose. Um, we have to choose to make that choice. You're going to look at Psalm 30 there, where it says, I've chosen. I've, I've chosen. I've made a choice in my life to obey. And we have to make a choice. There's an acknowledgement. Stuff's not great. There's the removal of whatever the barrier would be there. And then there's the cho- choice. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, it's not always easy to come out of darkness into light. You know, have you ever woken up and you're like, somebody pulls the curtains back. It's a bright day. It doesn't happen a lot in the Northwest. But, you know, and you're just like, you're, you've been asleep all night, totally dark. And now you're like, you know, it, it can be almost painful, you know, it, it would seem. But, you know, it's not always easy, is it? Some people would prefer to stay because they've gotten comfortable in the dark, you know. But, but coming into the light isn't always easy, but it's an important thing to be, to understand there's a choice factor. It, once you make the choice, there are, you know, sometimes, I mean, it's a process of wholeness and healing, and there can be counseling needed, and there certainly is community needed. We'll talk about that just finally in a sec, but... But it, there is a choice, and that's where it begins. You know, Aaron's been with us all morning, and uh, Aaron and his wife Renee I've known for a number of years. He's been with us for Christmas and Easter's past, and um, it, uh, you know, I've really always admired his um, benevolence in the community, charity work he does. Just have known he's a real guy, and uh, you know, not just a great talent musically. Um, Renee as well. I mean, we've had dinners and with Pam, and Aaron, and Renee, and I, and and uh, and groups of people, Tim Ellis, others, and uh, you know, I know that Aaron was raised in a Jewish home uh, that he's mentioned before. I think he would say it was pretty strict, uh, and uh, and Renee has known the Lord for quite a while. So it's been some interesting times. We've had some interesting talks, but Aaron is not only with us this weekend, which I'm so thankful for, but he was willing to share his story because his life really has taken a different turn these last couple of years. And I thought it'd be good just to have you hear that from him. So through this video, take a look. Where was Aaron Meyer two years ago? I I really didn't know who God was. You know, I went to Hebrew school as a kid and and I learned about the Old Testament and I, I heard the name Jesus Christ, but I just didn't know anything about it. It wasn't a part of my life. And as I grew up and, you know, ventured out onto my own, I had um, some behaviors that were very sinful. Um, but I didn't really understand any of the consequences of those behavior. And I was tempted in so many different ways. Uh, I gave into those temptations. And um, it started to affect my marriage my work, my relationship with my friends, just permeating all aspects of my life. Tried to fix it on my own, failed miserably every time. I was lucky enough to marry a a woman, Renee, and would talk to me about Jesus. And I began to intellectually understand who Jesus Christ was and why he was sent to this earth and what his message was, but I didn't know it here. 
I was headed off on a, on a trip to Southeast Asia for three weeks without my wife. And um, I knew I was in a bad place. Um, she had told me several times the only way I was going to overcome these challenges was to invite Jesus Christ into my heart. So I returned from this trip to Southeast Asia, came home, and I knew that I was going to have to make a change in my life. And that was kind of overwhelming. And I'd been home a couple of days, and on the third night that I was home, which was February 3rd, 2019, I awoke in the middle of the night and I got out of bed and walked down into my garage without really thinking about what I was doing. I got on my knees and I put my head to the ground and I was just so tired of you know, being broken and being behaving in a way that I didn't like anymore. I was just tired of it and I started talking to God and I asked him to forgive me and I asked him to help me, you know, what can I do to get through this? Just please, I, I can't take it anymore. And then I started to ball and just I felt this sort of pins and needles, sort of wave of heat overcome me and I just was, you know, bawling and I didn't feel like I was sad. I was just overcome with just this awe. I just let the emotion come out and I just sobbed for a while and finally pulled myself together and then I sat up and I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. And when that happened, I felt as if God had taken his Holy Spirit ray gun and <laughs> shot me from the crown of my head. Slowly, I felt it come into me and I just marveled and I had felt different from that moment forward and from that point on, I was able to sit with my wife and tell her things that I needed to get out that were not easy things to say. But gosh, you know, through the power of Jesus Christ, we did it together. And our marriage has gone through this renewal and healing process and God has restored our marriage and we're closer than we've ever been. And I can only thank Jesus Christ for being merciful and loving me and inspiring me to be a better person. Wow. Thank you, Aaron and Renee. Thank you, guys. I love how Aaron talks. You know, a lot of people, when they'll have an experience with God, will be like, well, God, this or the light, or it's like Jesus, Holy Spirit, you know, boom, <laughs> boom, laser. He's real. He's real. He's alive. And he's alive for you. He's alive for us. That's what Easter is about. You might be like Aaron. I love it. Hit me, touched me when Aaron said, I got tired of it. I got tired of it. You see how he went through this process in his own? It's the same process we go through from death to life. I got tired of it. We got to a point where it's like I'm willing to make this choice to leave the tomb behind and to give my life to him. Last one, acknowledge your need for community. Acknowledge your need for community in verse 44. And this is obvious, but it, it's an important part. It says, and he who had died, Lazarus, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, you might circle the word them, loose him and let him go. If you knew the way the Jews would, <laughs> would bury people, there's, it's, hard, it's amazing he even got out of the tomb. He was able to sort of waddle. In fact, I think one translation, more modern translation says he waddled out of the tomb. But he was like a moon suit, you know, mummified. And he had to have people unwrap him, help him. But that's a metaphor for life. We're, it's not a solo flight. We're, doing, we're not doing it alone. And hasn't that been a lesson this last year, I think, for every one of us? Pam has... Uh, been in a group of four women, uh, I think Sherry Harris, Barb Edwards, my sister Pam Wheeler, and they've played golf most Tuesdays this last year, even when the weather wasn't very good. And then, so they'll play quick nine holes, and then they'll have their group for longer than they played golf, which includes lunch and talking together and praying together and just doing life together in Christ. And Pam has told me more than once that it has been life-saving for her 
this last year to have this community of people. It's, it's part of why I really hope that if you're not in a group, or if you, and it's not about joining a small group, it's not it, but connection is what we need. Connection is the big need of our day, isn't it? We do need a deeper connection with each other. And so this series we're starting next week, I hope you can join us online or in person, but better together, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna offer, in fact, you can go to our website right now, you can go this afternoon, and, and see if there's anything that you feel drawn to where you can begin to connect with people, if this is a need in your life, and uh, we'll help you start something, if you wanna start something, tailgate party or something, whatever. I don't know where that idea came from, but we're into those ideas. Um, but you know what, I need it. In fact, sort of a confession, I, I know that the COVID has been hard on all of us. It's been hard on elderly people. It's been hard on our kids, really hard on our kids. But I think I've realized in recent weeks how hard it's been on all of us. I think every one of us have, COVID has done a number on us. And you know what? I haven't even known it until recently in my life. But I've only come to realize probably, probably in the last month that um, it's easy for me to withdraw from my wife. It's easy, e we're doing fine. Do pray for us, that's always welcome. But I, I just found that there's some things I didn't even notice that COVID's done. This being isolated, being, it's so easy for me to go there. It's so easy for me to you know, I work from home and I do this, but, but you know, the truth is I need you. I need us, I need community. And I don't know who specifically it is you need, but you need some people in your life to be able, you know, Lazarus needed it to really enter into the full life that God had planned. Same is true for you and me. He has a community for you. He has a community for you, you just need to find it. He'll show you, but you need to, you need to be open to that, so do I. So, last verse, and then we'll be done. Last verse, Romans 13, 11. To live like this is all the more urgent. We can have the band come back if they would. For time is running out, and you know it is a strategic hour. Listen to this. It is a strategic hour in human history. It is time for us, what does the scripture say? To wake up. <laughs> I admit that's true for me. Night's darkness is dissolving away as a new day of destiny dawns, and once and for all, we clothe ourselves with the radiance of light as our weapon. So the question, final question is this, what tomb is it time for you to leave? I do believe the Holy Spirit's asking us that question. I do believe the Holy Spirit is stirring our hearts, that there is an expectation and anticipation of a freedom of redemption in Christ, that we will be set free from mindsets and again, all those things that I talked about earlier so that we can enter into a new hope and a new life. That's what Easter is about through the resurrection and the life of Jesus Christ. So what is that for you? Are you willing to come out of the tomb into his light? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for Easter. And Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts today. And I confess, Lord, I, I, I need to come out. There are ways in my life that I've withdrawn. And Lord, I'm not a better man for it. And I pray you'd help me to come out into a fullness of light and community and the life that you have for me as a person, as a pastor. God, I pray for every one of us listening to my voice. That you wouldn't, that they wouldn't hear a pastor. They'd hear just a word of truth for them that would be helpful today. In fact, if you're here today and you've never opened your heart to Jesus, I think that's, is, that's the next step, isn't it? Just like Aaron acknowledged that day where he went into the garage at night. I mean, I remember my moment where it had come to, that was my next step. It was time to take it. Maybe your time is now to say yes to him. It's not he's saying yes to the church. You may never come back to this church. We hope you do, but that's not about that. But it is saying yes to the relationship with him. So let, let me pray for you right now. Let's pray. Jesus, pray right now, Lord. Thank you that you're here. Thank you that you're real. 
that we're not just speaking to the stars or the ceiling or whatever, but that, Lord, you're, as you said, right now, resurrection life. Right now, you're in the room. Lord, I pray for anyone right now that's being drawn, that they would open their heart, cross that line of faith, and that you would forgive their sin and they would come, that you would come into their life. Thank you, Lord, for not only receiving people today, but that you would lead us now from this day into the days to come to fulfill your assignment, your purpose here on earth. Thank you, Lord. And for all of us, Lord, though we've known you maybe for a while, Lord, if there's any area of death that it's time for us to step into life, show us what it is and give us the courage to follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, amen.